Welcome everyone, welcome back to GADMAC 2021. I'm Steve Glassie, I'm part of the organising committee for the conference. Um, and today's presentation is Preparing for Wildfire, how an AgPass program can mitigate wildfire's impact. And uh, this has been presented by uh, Max Moritz, Dr. Max Moritz, and also uh, Matt, sorry Matt, I, Shapiro. Sorry about that, Matt. <laughs> I was uh, just trying to find that, um, that covered page. Um, today's session um, is going to be quite pertinent, pertinent for a lot of people around the world. Um, but we want to start with just a little bit of housekeeping. The Zoom feature is disabled, so if you have any questions, please use your uh, please use the Q and A box, which is um, which we'll get to in terms of answering those questions towards the end of the presentation. Now, if you'd like to learn more about um, Matthew and Max, um, please head to our website and under speakers, you'll find their bio, um, not their bio, their bio and also the abstracts uh, for today's presentation. Now, we also have a short evaluation form. So when you complete today's session, please um, participate in that evaluation. And just a reminder that we have um, we are recording, but the recordings won't be available until they've been edited and made available as part of our GADMAC awards ceremony in July. Now we are on a number of social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and we encourage you to uh, join those and participate in those using the hashtag GADMNCONF, GADMACConf, um, so that we can get the message out there. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to um, welcome uh, Max and Matthew to talk about their fantastic uh, program. So handing over to you two gentlemen. Well, thank you. Um, I just got a note from Matthew that his internet went out. That's why we don't see him right now, which is potentially gonna cause some excitement, but we'll see. Um, so Matthew uh, is a uh, UC Cooperative Extension, University of California Cooperative Extension Livestock and Range Advisor uh, for a couple of counties in, in Southern Central Coastal California, uh, Ventura and Santa Barbara. And I am a statewide wildfire specialist within the University of California. Um, so I, I, I pretty much study anything to do with, with wildfire. And we're gonna talk today about a program that got off the ground locally here. Um, I'm gonna give a little background context and then I really hope Matthew's internet comes back and he's able to, to go into the case study um, that we based um, a recent publication off of about an ag pass. What you're looking at here is actually kind of useful. Um, this is a wildfire in Southern California, 2009 station fire. And we showed this just to note that um, during fires like this in, in many parts of the U.S., and I assume at least some other parts of the world, we have pretty large scale evacuations and road closures. And you see law enforcement here at these, at these checkpoints, basically not letting people back in uh, to, their, to their neighborhoods. And this affects not only urban uh, homeowners it affects agricultural community and that's really the the whole motivation for for how this program came to be so if you study fire long enough uh, especially in the u.s you're going to come up with a framework like this that people want to look at individual fire events and understand how they behave and what drove it so often it's broken into components of fuels versus weather versus topography and this is useful for understanding any given fire. Uh, um, my group has studied fire for, for uh, a while now, and we've looked at fire regimes over longer scales of space and time. And so we're more interested in, if you take a very broad look across different parts of the world, and this is just one year's worth of fires marching through um, the, the months at the bottom, you start to get a different set of of information about what's driving fire patterns at broader scales. What are the drivers uh, of, of how and when and the types of, of fires that we see? 
And so we've built models of this, which I want to walk you through just a little bit because it kind of informs how we ended up dealing with humans and, and in, in the models. Um, basically, why do we care? Well, climate change is one of the big issues, right? Um, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change features fire and focuses on fire. I had the good fortune of, of some of our, my lab's projections down here in the lower left being included in one of the more recent reports. Um, and I don't want to drag you guys through the, the models themselves because basically we've learned a lot since these projections were, were made. And also, really, we don't know which future we're likely to see. This is, these are projections made from a whole suite of, I think, 16 different global climate futures uh, based on uh, parameterized, calibrated on historical fire patterns. And we, so I don't want to focus on the patterns that we're seeing here, but um, there are many big parts of the world that are already observing increased fire activity, worse fires, larger fires. Um, and we're attributing much of this to, to climate change, right? So we've come up with a framework for understanding um, and modeling, quantifying and modeling the spatial patterns of ignitions, when it starts fires, um, uh, product, plant productivity uh, and resources to burn, what are the controls on those? And then atmospheric conditions, what are the biophysical conditions that, that control the length and the severity of the, the fire season? When we get to finer scales, um, like we've, we've done some of this similar work in California, these are the little orange um, fire history uh, patterns that you see here are about 50 years of fire occurrence in um, uh, over the different ecoregions of California, these bioclimatic regions. And we, we've learned a lot about why we see large fires or many fires um, in some ecoregions and not others. And, and a lot of this does boil down to biophysical uh, parameters, climate-related parameters that control <laughs> productivity of, of the fuels and the, the length and severity of the fire season. But when we start modeling at finer scales, the global stuff that we just looked at was maybe 50 to 100 kilometers. At one kilometer resolution, you really have to include people. You have to include the, the in this case, the power line corridors up and down California. There's been a lot of discussion recently of how under some of the worst wind conditions, we have power line failures and um, we have fires, you know, that start from these the infrastructure failures and, and burn into urbanized areas or quasi urbanized areas. So we realize more and more that we have to include human dimensions into the, the models, um, not just power lines, but housing densities, road densities, and so on. In building these models, then we can break we can break the projections into sort of the biophysical natural contribution um, um, on fuel productivity and fire season length and, and ignition sources, lightning. And we, get, we can get an idea of how sensitive are the, the fire patterns to those, that suite of, of variables, the biophysical variables. But then we can also look at the human variables, right? And we see something interesting. Human population densities on the landscape can push fire probabilities up or down, um, depending on the density of, uh, of, of the landscape and how, um, what the background rates of fire are and, and, and what human development is actually doing to the landscape. So it actually forces us to include humans more and more into our thinking. Whereas many of us um, studying fire as a biogeographer, I, I kind of tried to assume humans away for, for many years and doesn't, it doesn't really do any good. Um, so now we're really looking at this, that same construct, that fire regime triangle, and breaking it into the human uh, influences and the, the more natural influences. Um, and so that thinking, it, it, one way of framing that is through a, a coupled human natural system kind of framework. Again, many of us are studying fire in a given ecosystem, but really, or, or we're studying um, fire in a given human community and how it affects that community. But really, if we're gonna try to take an integrated approach, um, in this particular diagram, we're, we're kind of making the argument that these two dynamics come together at the wildland-urban interface. These places where humans are, are settling in, in somewhat flammable landscapes, um, and that's where these two systems come, to, to come together, the wildland-urban interface. Um, 
And how we develop these landscapes is, is important from an agricultural standpoint, um, the context that we're descri de describing here. If on the right, we have a traditional urban gridded um, uh, street pattern and, and urban design, um, this might be the core of the town. And as this town has developed, it's kind of moved out into the sub more suburban areas. This is a, a pattern we see all over California and in many parts of the US. And, and I'm not sure, I'm actually kind of curious how often this is replicated uh, outside. Um, we see a very different dynamic. We see cul-de-sacs that are hard to evacuate. We see sparser development that's a little harder to defend and, and, and also to evacuate longer distances. Um, this building pattern eats up more of the natural habitat, this darker, darker green, that's what it's supposed to represent. And as it expands, it eats up this hatched type of landscape. This is sort of agricultural landscape of one form or another, either ranch lands or farms. Um, and this is often called urban sprawl. Um, and it has a generally negative connotation for, for many different reasons. But basically, it's, it's sort of demonstrating that there's more and more people moving into these somewhat wild, but also somewhat agricultural landscapes. And there's actually kind of a conflict there um, that, that was the heart of why we, we started looking at this. Um, this wildland urban interface sprawl and expansion is happening all over the all over the, the US. I know in some parts of the world we have agricultural abandonment and movement out of ag lands and into urbanized areas. Um, in many parts of the US, we, we have the opposite, the opposite trend. We have increasing movement into um, agricultural areas. So, I mean, as a backdrop, we have increasing fire proneness, bringing more fire prone conditions to agricultural areas. And we have more people moving into agricultural areas, at least in our, in our in our areas. And with that, we end up having more evacuations during fire events and more road closures and more problems with people accessing um, not only their homes, but also their, their ranches and their farms. And, and that was the, the stimulus for, for, for the AgPass program here locally. So Matthew, if you're back on, it would be wonderful if you would show your face. I have a feeling he's not. So I'm gonna try to forge ahead. Um, this is one of those moments, everyone, where your co uh, in your co presenter doesn't show up. It's not Matthew's fault. But, um, okay. So here we have in our local area, um, these are two counties locally here on the central Southern California coast. This is Ventura County. Where, um, where the Ag Pass program began, and this is Santa Barbara County. Um, so basically, this is just showing kind of the grazing and farmlands. There's a lot of what we would call agricultural agriculturalists here in this part of California, much more than, than some other parts. And this map down here is showing the fire hazard severity zone maps for the state, um, making the point that you know, these, many of these very high dark red areas actually, and, and high, um, coincide with, with agricultural land of one form or the other. Um, and here is a map of past fires in this region, um, just since 1980. Um, and as you see, there's a huge amount of burning that's, that's happened in these areas. So there's been a, a lot of opportunities for people to have evacuations and to need, um, uh, to, to need something like an ag pass. <clears throat> this is to give you some background of um, what our landscapes look like here. You know, this is a, an orchard um, abutting a, a more native landscape of, of um, oak woodland and chaparral shrubland. Again, similar um, fires tend to come uh, out of the mountains. We have a condition of, of winds here called sundowner winds that blow hot, dry winds down slope and they'll drive fires from the, the wildlands out into um, the agricultural areas and, and into the urbanized areas. Vineyards locally, again with a coast live oak, uh, oak woodland and chaparral in the background. 
<clears throat> so for a little bit of background, um, you know, fire is, is not new to, to Ventura County and, and th this is where the Ivy Pass program originated. Um, one of the biggest fires in recorded history was the Wheeler Fire in just outside Ventura in 1985. And you can see from that fire, it's some evidence in the lower photo of fire coming out of the wildlands and into what looks like some agricultural areas, some, some orchards and, and fields. So in this context, the Ag Pass um, is not a statewide um, effort. It, it's a very local county-based program um, and it's focused mostly on commercial properties, right, both farms and ranches, um, as opposed to smaller boutique, um, boutique type, type agriculture. Um, the, the thing that has been a, a sticking point and, and maybe, um, maybe a topic of discussion is if you have an ag pass, it doesn't necessarily guarantee you access to your land. If you come to a place where the roads are closed, it's still really up to the discretion of the law enforcement person there, the emergency management people on scene to decide whether it's safe enough for you to actually return to your property, right? The goal has basically been twofold, uh, to allow people to go back to their agricultural lands to um, care for their own, you know, crops or, or animals. Um, and um, a secondary purpose, and it's turned out to be a really interesting um, opportunity in a way, is to give people uh, the ability, the second point here, to go back to their lands and actually help with, um, help with the emergency effort. Now, we don't necessarily want to be putting agriculturalists in harm's way. So they're not actually acting as first responders, but, you know, they can provide information uh, about resources, roads, water, supplies. And this, this photo down here at the bottom is, um, it's after an avocado uh, orchard owner was able to get back into his property and turn the irrigation on. And I believe this particular uh, this particular farmer was able to irrigate and actually when the fire ran up against their property, it only, it only scorched the outermost, uh, the outermost edges and, and the orchard itself stopped the, the fire from progressing through the property. Um, here in California, the, there is a precedent for this um, ability to get behind emergency lines and it comes from a press pass. If you're part of, a, if you're a journalist, part of the media, and you've signed up, um, gone through the proper paperwork, you can get access uh, behind the lines. Again, it's at the discretion of the emergency personnel, but you can get uh, access with your press pass. So we we kind of modeled some of the ideas after after this precedent. Locally, um, it depends on who are who the most active entities or agencies or organizations are in, in a given county. Um, this is just a, a, a list of possible um, groups that might be involved. Um, any one of these, it would have to kind of take the lead. It does really require that one group be in charge of, of, of pushing it forward. But, these are uh, uh, an array of, of, of agencies and organizations here that have been involved. Um, here's an example of an ID card, uh, what it kind of looks like. And there's an example application. Um, depending on the, the, the um, county that's doing it, at least in, in our local counties here, it's been kind of monitored and done through the, um, the county agriculture um, whoever the authority is uh, in the county that has uh, databases of, say, pesticide users, um, things that are regulated like that, it, it adds a layer of, of organization and, and it's helpful to have a, an agency involved like that that can provide some, some continuity, some standardization to it. Challenges and barriers, there's been a lot of problems. Um, with, and I, I think this is gonna vary from place to place, just who should be eligible, 
right? Is there a minimum size of, of, um, uh, of operation uh, in terms of numbers of people or size of, of uh, the property? Um, multiple locations, you know, what if, you, what if you're a, a farm or a, a rancher that, that has not just one place that you're in charge of? What if you need to, to try to get back and take care of multiple places? Um, mutual aid and communication. So um, basically in large events, there's lots of different agencies, lots of different fire professionals that show up. So you'll have people that are not local. Um, and so communicating that there is such a thing as an ag pass and that if you are a first responder or a law enforcement official that's at a, a road closure, this thing exists. Keep your eyes open for it. and um, you know, preparing them, that's a big part of the, 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 the I don't want to say the problem, but a big challenge. And this is ongoing. Every single fire season, this has to be done. Health and safety of farm workers, there's been a lot of uh, negative um, backlash against the fact that, you know, during some of these events, people were being evacuated, but the farm workers were still out there working the properties without protective gear. Right, so there's, there's this whole issue of training and preparation of, of the people that are gonna come back and, and, and do this, access the lands and, and, and play this role. Liability, um, there's big questions about, you know, um, if you let people back in, are, are, are the law enforcement folks liable, uh, responsible if anything goes awry? Um, how scalable it is, you know, again, how large, um, how large a property, but I think, I think the scalable here is is saying, look, if we if it's done at the county scale, is there any benefits to organizing and standardizing it across counties or even at uh, statewide? Roadblock protocols differ uh, from event to event, county to county, and and training. How do we come up with some standardized, organized training that makes sense? All right, I think we wanted to leave at least five to ten minutes. For questions, and I think this would have gone longer had Matthew been able to <laughs> to be here with us, um, because he really spearheaded much of this. Um, there is a publication that that uh, hopefully we can link, put a link to that on the website, so that um, people can actually read more about uh, the case study and, and and the process about starting your own AgPass program. Kind of what we thought people might want to know based on the lessons learned and, and the experiences that, that we've had here locally. But with that, I think I will open it up for, for questions. And That's a really insightful note. I really like the innovation <coughs> behind that pass. It's, it's certainly something that could be used or adopted in places that I've seen in, in New Zealand. Um, you know, having it led by um, organizations like the federated farmers, the, the farmers, farmers cooperatives to, to be actively involved um, is certainly an issue. I've, I've firsthand seen issues with farmers being denied access to, to properties. Uh, the Edgecombe floods come to mind. Um, they were told it was unsafe, they couldn't go in. But the reality was is that um, on many times throughout the year, the farmers used their tractors to go out in water um, to, to attend their stock. And sometimes the services don't understand the impacts um, when their access is denied, not just economically, but also for animal welfare. You know, right. the issues of uh, stock standing in, in uh, flood water when they could be moved to higher ground, they're not being milked, um, the loss of production, the mastitis that can be associated with that. So um, something like this can certainly go a long way to improve access. Uh, and allow um, these guardians of these animals to take responsibility. Because if one minute we say you're responsible for these animals, and then the next minute we say, but we deny you the opportunity to be responsible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's that balancing that you, you can't have shared responsibility unless you have shared control. Now, someone mentioned that as a quote the other day, I couldn't exactly remember. Um, but there's been a number of really good questions. Um, and let's just bring those up. Sorry, I did the wrong thing. So are there any plans to standardize this at the state level? So we have actually been approached by um, folks that are 
putting together legislation to to achieve something like that. Um, there, uh, I think, spearheaded mostly through the Cattlemen's Association here in California, um, and I think. I think there are really good reasons for standardizing some aspects of this. Say, you know, training, training and and um, protective gear and so on. There have to be some, there have to be some minimum levels of mm. of, of of safety, right? If you're going to do this, if you're going to let people back in there, there should be some basic safety training and protocols that are are standardized that we agree. You know, we agree as a society those are good. That's good guidance. That's a minimum level. Um, I think, so there is some benefit to, to imagining standardization of some aspects of it. On the flip side, I think agriculture um, and the patterns of, of fire, the fire ecology, the history, you know, and who's, who's doing what in every single community is going to be somewhat different, I think. Hmm. So, it's still not clear how much of this should be kind of a grassroots effort that's 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 different you know it's different based on the players that are 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 active and and motivated um in each in each community versus how much top down um guidance makes sense and so we're we're really just starting off and we we don't we don't have a a, a lot of experience actually to to recommend which which is the best way so um you know, maybe in a year or two, we'll have more more to say about that, but I don't think we know yet. And uh, Michelle said, um, well done on pushing through with the session. Um, there's nothing more unsettling than losing your co-presenter and then you've you've got the uh, the con for the whole so session. So you can't see you can't see the sweat stains in my armpits because of the <laughs> the video stops right at about the right place. They've so they sort of have circled, they've crossed in the center and, and yeah. looped back. Uh, well, you're, you. you're obviously well versed in, in crisis response, so well done. Um, but uh, Michelle's ask: Is Ag Pass is a Ag Pass application done prior to emergency events, or during, or both? Um, is there okay. a database who's been granted the Ag Pass in case someone doesn't have the ID physically on them? Oh boy, that's a really good question. Um, the last part, I do not believe it's gotten that sophisticated. I, it's not to the point where, you know, if you don't have your Ag Pass and you're at a checkpoint, you can, you know, uh, sh you know, flash a barcode or, or, or something like that. Uh, although that would be, there's reasons why that would make sense. Um, both in validating that somebody actually has a, a qualified true Ag Pass. Because one concern that did come up was that uh, there's looting sometimes that occurs behind the lines, right? Um, so if you're going to be letting people behind the lines, it's it's pretty important that they be credit. You know, it's a credible it's a credible allowance. Um, on the first question, from our experience, it's really important that this all be done well ahead of time. During during it's it's far too late to to start the process you know when there are fires happening really you know people have to have applied for and gotten these long beforehand and then each fire season we need to remind the local fire agencies and the local police and sheriffs you know the local law enforcement that sometimes get called in um, we need to remind them all that this program exists to expect you know that that, that during a crisis they may see them so. I think a lot of the legwork and a lot of the prep has to be done up front beforehand, not in the, not in the moment of, you know, not in the, in the crisis. And I'm glad you sort of raised the issue about some of those concerns with the past. Um, certainly in, in here, or in, in New Zealand, um, during the Christchurch quake, um, I was part of the urban search and rescue response, and we had vehicles that had magnetic signage um, on them saying civil defence, rescue and the likes. Um, and I remember one time we popped into a, a convenience store and we came out and all our magnetic signage had been stolen so that oh. people could use it to get, get in. Oh. Oh, so, that's um, yeah. that's, uh, so, so people do exploit um, these disaster situations and um, one of the uh, ways that, um, uh, that has been sort of quite useful is that the International Technical Rescue Association has a certification program which relies on a QR code. 
And so that QR code can provide real-time validation um, yes. because as we found in the Christchurch quake, if you've got a laser printer and a laminator, you can make up all your own um, purportive uh, resources, unfortunately, although it may be a crime. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so another question from, uh, from Dave. Does the county maintain a, um, oh no, that's pretty much, we've answered that one there. Um, coming back to Julie, how much collaboration between UCCE advisors is taking place? Um, I don't even know what a UCCE advisor is, I'm sure you'll know. Sure. Um, we do have a fireline safety uh, training program similar to CAL FIRE hired vendors. Um, I'm in Sonoma County where it's taken years to get a similar program but it took a full week to get the document issued in 2020. I knew about Ag, Ag Pass when it began, along with other ranches. Um, how do we how do we encourage more collaboration on this? Great. Well, certainly putting some putting a bug in the ear of your local uh, UCCE is University of California Cooperative Extension. Um, yeah, the county-based advisors. The reason we wrote the document starting your own Ag Pass program was really truly uh, they were the main audience they were one of the main audiences it was to try to give the rest of the network of, of the uc cooperative extension um, an example and, and a bit of a roadmap. if you want to start a program like this you know here's here's our experience and here's here are some things that you'll run into um, and, and some things to consider so we are in the process uh, of of trying to reach out and 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 make this more of a statewide effort. So hopefully up in Sonoma, it won't be too long before we could, um, we could engage and, and help, help kind of train the trainers, you know, help bring this to, to your community to there too. And what about an all hazards approach that seems to be um, around the wildfire, um, but do you think it could have an application of extensions like floods and other, other kinds of events? So, there is some, again, going back to the, um, the press pass uh, precedent here, that, that the press is basically able, you know, th that's the same idea, right? All hazards, any, not just hazards, you know, they, they can get behind the police lines, right? They can get behind law enforcement lines for any number of different reasons. And so, yes, I think that there's no reason this should be focused only on wildfire. Um, it is the most common, at least in our, you know, in our part of the world, it's definitely the most common natural hazard that leads to evacuations and road closures and thus the need for a program like this, right? Um, but that's not to say that there aren't other parts of, of, uh, of the world for sure, or even other, other hazards in California that um, if we could somehow standardize this and, and um, and broaden it, uh, it I, I don't see why it couldn't apply to other to other natural hazards. And so do you, um, we're just coming to towards an end and uh, what was the motivation really behind this this ag pass? Was there specific events that triggered the need? You know it's been around for a while much much before I became aware of it and if Matthew were here, <laughs> Matthew would be able to, to I, I think some of those introductory slides going back to the Wheeler fire of 1985 may have been part of that story. I don't know how far back the Ag Pass or something like it. I don't know the lineage, um, but, but it, I, I'm sure that there are other communities where a similar idea has sort of rippled up through, you know, through time. Around here, it was it was in in Ventura County, and and largely because a handful of of um, agriculturalists banded together and decided they wanted to they wanted to do something about it, and, and and that's how it emerged. I I really I'm sorry I don't have a better handle on the history though. Well, you've done extremely well to uh, to pick up the the knowledge behind the egg pass from um, from Matthew. So um, well done for managing that crisis. Um, that brings us to an end for today's um, session. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Max Moritz, uh, and you. also uh, Matthew Sh uh, Shirap uh, Shirapo. Shapiro. Um, Shapiro, sorry. Um, so thank you for both of you um, 
joining us today, even though you joined a bit longer. We appreciate it. And uh, thanks for coming to, to GADNAC. Absolutely. Happy to have been invited. It's, it was an honor. And, I, and I, uh, I think much of the credit goes to Matthew. So please uh, shunt most questions to him. <laughs> and he'll be able to enjoy that when he sees the video later this year. So <laughs> well done to you both. Um, I'm glad yeah. you had a good, good contingency plan there. So um, well done. And we look forward to um, seeing you again. You bet. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. You bet.